Greetings everyone, my name is Errol Coder, and this is Plantry Television. <laughs> Building spaceships at SpaceX, this week on Planetary Radio. Welcome to Public Radio's Travel Show that takes you to the final frontier. I'm Matt Kaplan of the Planetary Society. Did you catch our PlanRad Live show last spring? One of our guests was Jeff Rakiki, the Director of Structural Engineering at SpaceX. This time, we are Jeff's guest at the California plant that built both the Falcon 9 rocket and the Dragon spacecraft that recently made commercial space history. Join us on the factory floor in a couple of minutes. Bill Nye wants to know if his Flash Gordon-style single stage to orbit spaceship might someday be built in the United Kingdom. And Bruce Betts will share his view of the current night sky just before he conjures up another random space fact. He'll also help me give away a Planetary Radio t-shirt in our latest space trivia contest. As always, we'll first visit with Emily Lakdawalla, the Planetary Society's Science and Technology Coordinator and the editor of its blog that you can find at planetary.org. Emily, we're going to check in with a couple of uh, old friends this week, uh, beginning with Akatsuki, and there was some interesting and positive news. I wouldn't exactly call it news, but it prefigures the kind of creativity that JAX is going to be coming up with as they try to figure out what to do with their Akatsuki spacecraft, which, of course, was supposed to go into Venus orbit but failed to enter orbit because of a possible serious problem with its main engine. They still have a very capable spacecraft that's in orbit near Venus's orbit, and they've got about six years until the spacecraft gets back around to Venus. In the meantime, it seems like they're considering actually trying to do flybys of a couple of asteroids. Now, it can be kind of hard to do asteroid flybys with in-flight spacecraft because usually there's not a lot of maneuvering fuel to spare. But this spacecraft still has all the fuel on board that it was supposed to use to enter Venus orbit. So it actually has a ton of fuel available. And so they could actually send this spacecraft, a perfectly capable one, to do flybys of a couple of asteroids that are very close to the sun. And these are the kinds of bodies that we've never visited before with spacecraft. So that's a very exciting possibility. Another possibility is... They're trying to figure out how they're going to be able to enter orbit with a possibly damaged main engine. And one thing that could help them get into orbit is if they do a lot of the velocity correction before they even get there. And so if they manage to slow down the spacecraft a bit before they next get to Venus, not only could they reduce the amount that they'll need to get out of their main engine, but they could actually get to Venus a whole year faster than they're currently talking about. So both of these things just show how creative the Japanese engineers can be when they've got a damaged spacecraft. They can always come up with great ideas to get new missions out of them. Yeah, I'm sure they would prefer not to go this route, but they have proven in the past that they are quite capable. All right, let's uh, go over to the Dawn spacecraft. I, I see that there is another update from uh, Mark Raymond in the blog. Yeah, Mark checks in once a month, and, and for the last several updates, he's been going into great detail about what exactly Dawn's going to be doing at Vesta once it gets there next summer. And the latest update is about the low-altitude mapping orbit when the spacecraft is less than 200 kilometers from Vesta. And I'll remind you that Vesta is about 500 kilometers in diameter, so it's less than one Vesta radius from the surface. And at that distance, it'll be close enough to actually feel the lumps and bumps in Vesta's gravity field. So not only will they be doing high high-resolution imaging, but they'll also be pointing the spacecraft's radio dish at Earth and watching the Doppler shift. And with that, they'll be able to map the gravity field in great detail, which not only tells you about the shape of the body, but also tells you if the mass inside the body is distributed maybe asymmetrically. And they think that Vesta is the remnant of a larger body that was blasted into numerous pieces by a large collision. Vesta is probably the, the biggest part of that proto-body. Um, but it's quite likely that the mass inside it is distributed, you know, with lumps and bumps here and there. So it'll be a very interesting result to see from the Dawn mission. Well, there you have it. It's all in the blog and a lot more coming from Emily Lakdawalla. Emily, thanks as always. Thank you, Matt. She is the Science and Technology Coordinator for the Planetary Society and a contributing editor to Sky and Telescope magazine. We'll talk with Emily again next week. Now it's time to hear from Bill. Hey, hey, Bill Nye, the Planetary Guy here, Executive Director of the Planetary Society. And this week in the news of space, once again, is the Skylon rocket plane. Okay, this will be a plane built in the United Kingdom for 12 billion euro or so. And it would fly from a runway 
with wings up above the atmosphere, turn on another engine, and be in orbit. It would be fantastic. If you could really pull this off, and all the claims, the extraordinary claims that they have of making the thing sufficiently lightweight and the engine sufficiently powerful and reliable, you could take so many people and so much stuff into low Earth orbit, it would change the world. It would make space more accessible for more of us. And then who knows what we would find beyond that. If we could get to low Earth orbit more cheaply, fewer euros per kilo, fewer dollars per kilo per pound in the old 20th century terms, it would change the world. It would be very exciting. Now, this gets back to the old beer can problem. This is to say the amount that the liquid in a soda can or beer can weighs compared with the weight of the can is about the same as what you got to do for this space plane. You got to make it extremely lightweight, and yet you still want to carry something up there and bring it back. Now, is this problem not solvable, or is it just so close? Well, maybe in this coming year, 2011, we'll find out. Because you know what we're going to discover out there, out there in space? Nobody knows. That's why we're going. I got to fly Bill Nye the Planetary Guy. First, a successful flight of its powerful Falcon 9 rocket. Then, barely a month ago, a second Falcon 9 put a Dragon capsule in orbit. That capsule soon became the first commercial spacecraft to return safely to Earth, splashing down in the Pacific Ocean. Designed to carry cargo and eventually people to low Earth orbit, Dragon this time carried a no longer secret cargo of cheese, a 17-inch wheel of Le Bruyere. SpaceX CEO and Chief Technology Officer Elon Musk said it was a tribute to Monty Python's cheese shop sketch. If all goes well, the next Dragon will approach the International Space Station in a demonstration of its rendezvous talents. That Dragon, like all others, will be built at the huge SpaceX plant in Hawthorne, California. Jeff Rikiki has a cubicle there, not far from the one occupied by Mr. Musk. There are no private offices at SpaceX, but there are conference rooms, and that's where I began my recent conversation with Jeff, the company's Director of Structural Engineering. Jeff, it is always a pleasure to talk with you, and always a pleasure to come here to this place where you guys build spaceships. I'm glad you make, uh, can make it there, Matt. It's always fun to uh, talk with you guys and do a lot of work with you folks out there at the Planetary Society. i got to ask the question that, uh, that everybody is most curious about. Where's the cheese? Where's the cheese? I wish I knew. Uh, we, we've been talking about it. Uh, we had a Christmas party, and we were all wondering whether or not we were going to be served up pieces of cheese at the Christmas uh -huh. party or not. <laughs> could that mission, could that test flight have gone much better? Uh, I really don't think so. I mean, uh, we've been going through the data for this particular flight. We're still going through it. Uh, the one thing that kind of makes us a little bit nervous is the fact that everything seems to be going perfect. <laughs> Uh, that as an engineer, you always get kind of nervous when that happens. I think so far, the only thing I've heard that we've had any issue with is we had one temperature sensor that broke on us. Mm. That was it. Out of the thousands of sensors we have all over it, and, you know, we do triple redundant on any really critical one. And this one wasn't even critical. It was just a, well, what kind of temperatures do we get in this area type uh, sensor. So it went really, really good. Mm-hmm. You know, I already told you what a thrill it was to see, once again, a capsule coming down under three big parachutes. You must have had some sense of history out of that as well. I did. A lot of this now, I, I was back out in Florida for this particular flight, but last August when we did our parachute drop, I was uh, I was camera two in one of the helicopters. Uh -huh. And as it was uh, the capsule we dropped it there, it's coming down under three chutes. I did have a flashback of when I was in the fourth grade watching the Apollo... Uh, capsules land uh, on the black and white TV. It, it's funny, is you, you sit here, you work with it every day, you're really close to it, and you kind of forget a little bit on the significance of what's being done and kind of the cool factor of what's being there. But then every once in a while, you see it, and it hits you, and it just kind of floors you a little bit. Uh, you don't kind of real, realize it because you're so close to it. But uh, I think those it, it's moments, a lot of fun. I think those moments are very important. Let me go back to what you said a moment ago, because I thought about that for a second. You said that as an engineer, you, you kind of worry a little bit because things went so well. I guess, you know, maybe you do want things at this stage to fail in minor ways so that you can say, oh, look, there's something we need. 